Hey guys, today I'm going to introduce you to Mississippian and bear hunter extraordinaire, Hope Collier. I got Richard behind the camera and Robbie doing the driving. Come along with us. Let's go explore. I think the Hope Collier story is one of the most extraordinary stories we've come across. And outside the region of the Mississippi Delta, it seems to go largely unnoticed. We have a video about the early years of Holt's life, and we'll leave that connected to an end screen on this one. You really need to watch both videos if you're going to understand Holt at all. This, of course, is Holt's grave, or what is portrayed as Holt's grave, in Live Oak Cemetery in Greenville, Mississippi. Holt was an African American seen here, former slave, and we'll pick his story up somewhere around 1872. He tells the reporter one day, after the war, there was a whole lot of carpetbaggers come down here and I had a heap of trouble with them. I sure did have a tough time in the Reconstruction days. I had to look out for myself all the time and didn't sleep much. Holt had ridden with the 9th Texas Cavalry and then the Delta Rangers during the Civil War and generally supported the Confederate war effort. But we talk about all that in that other video I mentioned. And so we don't chase those rabbits again. We'll just end it with that carpetbagger rule ended with the election of 1875 that, of course, put the Democrats in power in the state of Mississippi for the next hundred years. During this time period, there really wasn't much money in the Mississippi Delta. If you were employed, you worked in timber production, or you worked for the railroad, or you worked on levee building. Holt became a hunting guide because, well, he loved doing that, and that meant that he wouldn't have to be a sharecropper and pick cotton. He received somewhere around $60 or more for a black bear and about 30 cents a pound for deer. Holt was known for his large packs of mixed breed dogs that he would train to trail and track the bear. Holt, of course, was the best at following an existing trail and tracks and looking at tree marks and can tell you what kind of bear it was. Holt had a fantastic reputation as a bear hunter. One season, he made somewhere around $900. Another time, he had close to $2,000 on him. In 1877, he financed a baseball club called Holt Collier's Club from Deer Creek. Holt was urged by the Hines family and the Metcalf family to save his money, but of course he didn't. When it wasn't hunting season, he loved to travel and he gambled. He would store his stuff at his brother Marshall's house, and he would just go north and gamble his money away. Holt still maintained a somewhat unique relationship with all the planters in the area. For instance, he taught Senator Leroy Percy how to hunt quail. During the 1880s, he was married to a lady named Rose and had three kids, but we have no idea what happened to them. The Collier family lived near Stoneville, but by this time Holt's dad was dead and his mom was old. In 1880, Thomas Hines, who was the son of the man who once owned Holt Collier, Thomas lived with Holt's sister Augusta, and they had around six children. They were not legally married because the state of Mississippi didn't view interracial marriages as legal back in those days. In the 1890s, Holt married a lady named Maggie Phillips, and he became the bear hunting god of choice for the wealthy and the elite. On November 24, 1898, the local newspaper reported that the great bear hunter, Holt Collier, had killed a very large black bear at Swiftwater Plantation just south of Greenville. This was newsworthy at that time because the railroads had really taken away a lot of the black bear habitat by that time. Holt, of course, was still hunting out of necessity, not for sport. Teddy Roosevelt had become a household name during the Spanish-American War. He, of course, was a noted conservationist, and wildlife enthusiast, and yes, an avid hunter. He really wanted to come south and hunt and kill a black bear. A Mr. Fish, who was the president of the Illinois Central Railroad, and had connections in the Mississippi Delta because, well, of all that railroad construction, 
was a friend of the president's, and he arranged the bear hunt. He wrote to a man named John Parker, who was later the governor of Louisiana. John Parker wrote to E.C. Mangum of Sharkey County, Mississippi. He owned and managed a great tract of cotton land in Mississippi, so Parker asked him to arrange the bear hunt. Mangum wrote to Hugo Foote, George Helm, and Senator Leroy Percy to ask them for their help. So the bear hunt took a little bit of time to set up. President Roosevelt became concerned that the hunting party was becoming too large, and he made it clear that he wanted to kill the first black bear. It was 56-year-old Hope Collier's job to locate some black bear and set up the hunt. Hope was quoted as saying, Of course, him being a stranger, we wanted to make sure he killed a bear. Wouldn't never do to have a gentleman come that far and not get a bear. So Holt had about a month to locate the bear, set up camp, and cut trails. There's just no way you can understand how much work this was unless you've ever been in a Delta cane break. The cane is so thick that it's very difficult for a human being to walk through there. Holt had to find an area that was large enough to accommodate the six guides that he hired to help make the hunt happen, and a cook, and all the hunters. That was quite an accomplishment in just a month. Holt chose Ben Johnson and Freeman Wallace to serve as guards, and the guides for the hunt were Thomas McDougall, Bill Enolds, Calvin Dorsey, and his brother Frank Dorsey. All of these men were African American. I left out a guy named Swint Pope. He was the cook. On November 12, 1902, the newspaper headlines read something like, President Rides Train to Hunt Mississippi Bear. On November the 13th, the hunting party arrived at Smeed's Station. Everyone in the presidential party, I think with the exception of one person who was sort of a de facto security guard, everyone had to wait at Smee's station. Holt put his guards on the road and told them basically to shoot anybody that came down it. This didn't sit well with members of the press. Not sure if it was the lack of access or the fact that two armed African Americans were allowed to refuse them access to the president. President Roosevelt told Holt the first night that he wanted the bear. Holt tried to explain to him that it wouldn't be so easy, but eventually he even told the president that he would lasso one if he had to. The men in the hunting party laughed, but Senator Percy says, well, Holt does exactly what he says, but the president seemed a little doubtful. The next morning at 8 o'clock, Holt put the president and Huger Foote and a hunting blind and told them to wait. By early afternoon, at Mr. Foote's suggestion, they broke for camp to eat a late lunch. Holt's pack of 40 dogs had been running a bear since early in the morning, and he heard the dogs had a bear bayed up. Holt said it pestered him that he did not hear a shot. When Holt got to his dogs, he saw that the bear was bayed up right by the log that he left the president sitting on. When Holt arrived, the bear stepped off in some water, probably to get away from Holt's dogs. When the bear raised up in the water, he had between his forepaws Holt's favorite hunting dog. Holt yelled, Let go of my dog, bear! Holt couldn't shoot because he would risk killing two or three of his dogs in the process. Holt leapt into the water as he swung the stock of his gun toward the base of the bear's skull. The bear let go of the dog, but it was too late, for the dog was dead. One of the Dorseys had run off to get the president. At that point, Holt yelled for someone to bring him his lariat or his lasso, but nobody would. Holt said, I put my foot right between the bear's legs, and when he raised his head out of the water, I dropped the lariat over his neck and went out of the water and tied the other end to a willow tree. He caught another dog in there, and I ran in to save the dog, 
and hit the bear with both hands across the head with my rifle. That knocked him down and broke his skull. When he reared up, he looked higher than I was. He was higher than me. I bent the breech of my rifle so that I couldn't shoot it. A short time later, President Roosevelt, who, while he was on the hunt, required that he be called Colonel, Mr. Foote, and several others in the hunting party, arrived just as hard and as quick as they could ride. Holt tells the story that when President Roosevelt got there, he ran into the water, and Collier suggested, don't shoot him while he's tied. Others shouted for the president to kill the bear. President Roosevelt would not shoot the bear while he was restrained. Holt said in a later interview that some of the other gentlemen wanted to shoot the bear, but I knew the dogs would rush in and get killed before the bear died, so I told them if they gave me $1,500 for the dogs, they could have the bear. They didn't want him after that. Though he refused to shoot the bear, President Roosevelt was dumbfounded by what he had seen. Holt said, They all laughed, and the colonel looked at it a long time and asked how it was I did it. Then he said, That's wonderful, wonderful. I've never seen anything like that before. Remember, the night before, they had all laughed at Holt when he promised the president that he would lasso him a bear. The bear was a full grown male bear, not the cub that is pictured in the cartoons. He weighed about 235 pounds, but should have been up around 500. As Holt described the bear, he was poor as a snake. From tip of nose to outstretched hind foot, the bear was six feet seven inches. John Parker, who had ridden with Holt all day, wanted to claim the bear after the president refused to. Holt says he told Mr. Parker to take the knife out of my belt and stick the bear. I put my fingers over his heart where I wanted him to stab him. Parker missed the mark and when the knife went in, the bear jumped. Mr. Parker nearly pushed Holt on top of the bear, trying to get out of the lake, and left Holt to attend to the bear. After returning to camp that night, President Roosevelt told Holt that he was the best hunting guide he had ever seen. Holt sat apart from the hunting party at night as they gathered around the fire to tell stories. Holt conducted himself as if he knew he belonged. In fact, he was in charge of the situation. One of the reporters that made it to camp said he had an air about him like that of a chief. Even though the camp was segregated in his setup, Holt and his storytelling integrated the camp around the fire at night. The previous afternoon, Holt had carried the bear across his horse back to Smee's station. One of the reporters located there said, Is that the bear the president killed? To which Holt replied something like, No, but he would have if he'd have stayed where I put him. Of course, the press had a field day with Holt's response. While three bears were taken during that hunting trip, President Roosevelt didn't kill any. You've been looking at some of the cartoons that were created in response to this trip. One newspaper headline read, President outsmarted by lowly hunting guide. While the hunting trip was a local success, the president considered it frustrating and thought the press was bad. The president promised Holt that he would come back in three years. He did make it back for another hunt with Holt, but it was on the Louisiana side of the river, and it was more like five years. This time in 1907. The owner of Mitchum's Candy Shop in Brooklyn saw the cartoon and made a teddy bear that it set in its window. It sold the teddy bear for $1.50. In a short time, they closed the candy shop and were selling over 100,000 bears a year. They became Ideal Toy Corporation. Ideal Toy Corporation later produced such iconic toys like the Evil Knievel, motorcycle riding, daredevil action figure, and the Rubik's Cube. Many newspaper and magazine articles were written about Holt over the years, like this one in the New York Times, but perhaps the most famous article was written by Teddy Roosevelt himself. 
It appeared in the January 1908 issue of Scribner's magazine. As a gift to locals who helped make the hunting trip possible, the president left several 1886 Winchester 4570 hunting rifles. He gave one to Holt, and it remained his prized possession, until some folks tricked him out of it in the 1930s. Holt and the president maintained a correspondence of sorts throughout the years, and even though Holt was in his 60s at this point, he kept his hunting stuff ready for the moment when his friend, Colonel Roosevelt, would call wanting to go on another hunt. When Holt learned of the president's death, he retired from hunting for good. Holt Collier was 66 years old when he made his last verified kill of a black bear. The same month the president's article came out about him in Scribner's, Holt bought a lot on Broadway Street in Greenville and built a house where he remained for the last 28 years of his life. Knowing that the Mississippi River occasionally flooded, he built his house with a second story. His is the only one in the neighborhood that is two stories. Holt would sit on the front porch of his house, and if the local kids, be they white or black or a mixture of both, could scrape up enough money to buy him an orange knee-high and a plug of tobacco, he would tell them stories. By this point in his life, the people that Holt loved and had generally taken care of him his entire life were beginning to die out. After the great flood of 1927, where Holt and his wife had to spend four months in that second floor of their home, many in his neighborhood left in 1928, and Holt became depressed. His wife, Frances, was a housekeeper. She was 30 years younger than Holt. Holt received $200 a year pension from the state of Mississippi for his service to the Confederacy. Holt would train and sell dogs and occasionally bootleg whiskey. In 1929, Senator Percy died. Holt got a loan that was paid off by his friend Harley Metcalf Jr. He got this loan to fix the damage done to his home by the flood of 27. His wife Frances dropped dead from a stroke in October of 1931, and Clive Metcalf died, and there was really no one left for Holt. On Wednesday, August the 1st, 1936, the great and an intriguing Holt Collier died. His funeral was at Mount Horeb Church on the corner of Broadway and Nelson in Greenville. Just think about how Holt Collier changed your world because of the way he lived. The teddy bear is the state toy of the state of Mississippi. I think William Faulkner's character, Sam Fathers and Go Down Moses, is based on Holt Collier. There are many other things we could say and describe for you about Holt Collier and his life. I hope I've inspired you in some small way to at least Google his name and learn more about him and realize that you too can change the world with the things you say and do. Thank you.